day, there is a, an abundance of grace. Lamentations 3.22 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his, mercy, his compassions fail not. Um, great is thy faithfulness. Oh, there's another line that says that his mercies are new every morning. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And faithfulness is one of the, my favorite words to describe the Lord. And I am thankful for that faithfulness. Um, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Um, Malachi, I believe, says something similar to that. Um, I am the Lord, I change not. That's Malachi, I believe it's, I forget what chapter, but he says, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. And that, to me, is the greatest hope that we could ever have, that God's faithfulness to us day in and day out never changes. If it changed, then we should be, then we should be very afraid, right? Because if he vacillated between faithfulness and unfaithfulness, if he was to change his mind, then he could very well change his mind about what he wants to do with us. And grace may not be one of those things, but his faithfulness day in and day out, from the, from the foundation of the world, that faithfulness has been unchanged. It has been unwavering. Was he at times very, very um, angry with his people? Yes, many times he wanted to destroy them. But at one particular time in, in Exodus, I believe it's chapter 32 or 34, I forget exactly the chapter, but he told Moses, get out of the way. I'm fixing to kill them all. And Moses says, if you kill them, then you kill me too. And Moses stood in the gap, something that we, we would not see, we would not really understand, I guess, in the Old Testament to that degree. In the New Testament, we can see it because we've experienced it for ourselves because we're all sinners. We've all, at least we've all sinned, put it that way. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, and yet he didn't thump us off. But his grace was extravagant towards us in that he forgave us abundantly. He forgave us many, many times. And he continues to do that day in and day out. But in the Old Testament, it, is, it seems so unimaginable that one man could stand in the gap for a nation of people and, and, and save their very souls from destruction. But that is how God, that is the faithfulness of God to his people. I have to believe that if he is omni, omniscient as we, as the Bible says he is, he knew what Moses was going to do when he said that. And that was, um, would he have done it if Moses hadn't have stood in the gap? Yes, I believe he would have. But Moses stood in the gap, and he did exactly what the Lord knew he was going to do, and that, that set a precedent, at least in my mind, for what was to come many, many years down the road because the only place you find grace in the Old Testament was when Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But that's not the same grace that you find in John chapter 1 where, where Jesus came, and grace, uh, he said that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ not the same grace. The grace in the Old Testament was God found a man that, that would trust him. He found a man that he could use. He found a man that was, um, that was faithful to God in, in some regard. Therefore, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the God said, that's the only one I can use. So he used him. But the grace in the New Testament is not just unmerited favor. Grace in the New Testament is that supernatural power, that working of the Spirit that does for us, in us, and through us what we cannot do ourselves. Yes, many times people have defined grace as unmerited favor, but grace is way more than just unmerited favor. Unmerited favor is what grace gives, but grace is not just the unmerited favor of God. You ask the average person on the street, the average churchgoer on the street, they will, that's the answer they will give you is it's unmerited favor. 
but grace goes way beyond just giving us what we need. Grace has given us way more than what we ever could deserve. And that grace is the supernatural working of His Spirit in our lives to do for us what we cannot do ourselves. Amen. Well, I don't know where all that came from. but Well, I do know where it came from. But I was ex expecting that. So we will go into prayer right now. Are we good? All right. So again, let me say to you all, welcome here on Wednesday night. It is good to see you, all of you here, believing for a good time in the Lord tonight. I know that there are some that are out. We need to pray tonight. Well, let me finish. Welcome to all of you, those of you joining in online with us tonight at the Rock Church in Clute, Texas. Welcome. And uh, we believe that by you joining in with us tonight, that God is going to speak to you there just as much as he is to us here in the building. So we pray that you will connect with us, connect in the spirit, not just online with us. Yes, we'd love for you to connect if you're, you're able to uh, go to our website, trcfamily.org. There's a connect card there. We'd love for you to connect with us. Let us know who you are, where you're watching from, perhaps, or you can do that on Facebook. But, but welcome and we are happy that you are here with us. And if you're able to be in the area and you would like to join us at 540 South Main here in Clute, Texas, we would welcome you with open arms. We'll give you a fist bump and we'll, we'll fake a hug. Uh, but you're welcome to join us. And for those of you in the building, may the Lord richly bless you. I know this is midweek. This is hump day. Today's typically been, for years, it's been that Hardest day of the week to get past Wednesday. Once you get over Wednesday, it's just a quick trip to the weekend, right? But, amen, we're glad that you're here. Uh, Brother Rodriguez, we missed you and Alex Sunday. Glad that you all are home safely. How did it go? Success? Good. Happy for you. Amen. So if you would stand with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. We need to remember tonight, Sister Smith is not feeling well. She texted and said that she had planned to be here, but she is not able to be here due to um, not feeling well. Um, we need to pray for, um, I talked to Justin Burkfeld. I was asking him a question about something else before service, and uh, Anna and Logan both are running fever tonight, so we need to pray for both of them. Um, I have no idea what that is about. We need to lift up Brother Juan and Sister Julie tonight. Um, you heard Sunday that his sister-in-law passed away. Well, his brother also passed away uh, yesterday, yesterday morning. And so, um, so we need to pray for the family. There is another brother and a sister, I believe. So we need to pray for God's strength to be with all of the family during this time. And then the, the son, I believe he's an only son that uh, was left to care for his father. So we just lift this whole family up in prayer. Um, if there are any other requests, just make it known with an uplifted hand. We, we know that God is faithful. So let's pray together, not just for these, but as the word goes forth, that it will go forth in power and in authority. Father, in the name of Jesus. We come boldly to the throne of grace. We have this extreme confidence in you, Father. A, a confidence, O oh Lord, that cannot waver. A confidence, O oh Lord, that is as sure as the sunrise in the east every morning. But even then, O oh Lord, your, that confidence goes all the way back to the foundation of the world. For, O oh Lord, the Word of God says that you have chosen us, you selected us in you before the foundation of the world. And so, Lord, this is our confidence that we have tonight, that the faithfulness of God endures throughout all generations. And so, Lord, in that we pray right now, believing for these names that were called for Sister Smith to be healed in her body, O oh Lord, from the crown of her head to the sole of her feet. We pray tonight for Anna and Justin and Logan, O oh Lord, the fever tonight. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke the fever. We command any infection in the body to be removed, to be made every whit whole in Jesus' name.
God, we pray for Brother Juan and Sister Julie tonight and all of Brother Juan's family as they grieve the loss of the brother and sister-in-law. Father, we know tonight that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. That what you have done before, O oh Lord, you can do also again. And so, Lord, we loose now those, those arms, those everlasting arms to, to go underneath and to support this family, strengthening and encouraging them during their time of loss. And God, every other need that was mentioned by the uplifted hand, we lift those before you, Father, believing in healing and deliverance and for salvation in Jesus' name. But Lord, tonight in this room, we are about to open the Word of God. We're about to walk into a, a, a supernatural Word, God, the living Word of God. And God, we're just humans. We're just people. God, we've got our flaws. We've got our issues and struggles. And yet, oh Lord, you've invited us to be a participant with you in your kingdom. And so, Lord, that kingdom is based in and upon and all around the Word of God. And so, Lord, give us wisdom and understanding. Give us the clarity of mind to grasp and understand what the Spirit is trying to say to us. God, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive, I pray. And God, let the Word of God come through me, I pray, in the same anointing that in which it was written in the, in the very anointing that it was given to the people who it was written to, Father. Let it come forth through us, in through me, to us in this room, I pray. God, I'm your mouthpiece. You, you chose me, I didn't choose you. Uh, you called me, Lord, I didn't choose this calling. You chose it for me. So, Lord, I'm presenting myself as an instrument, as a vessel for you to flow through right now in Jesus' name. Lord, according to your word, I submit my will to your will. I cast every care that I have upon you right now, O oh Lord. Submitting to your authority and to that authority that you've put over me, Lord. I submit to that authority tonight in the name of Jesus. And I give all the glory, the honor, the praise unto the one who was and is and is to come, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. And with that being said, let me say to you, Bishop and Sister Smith, may the Lord richly bless you. I give honor to you tonight. Underneath whose authority I stand right here tonight. Amen. So I want to take you to the book of Ephesians. This is not what I thought the Lord was going to do. I thought I had direction. And then just uh, before we were finishing up getting ready, uh, the Lord changed my mind. It was something that I had started praying. When I started praying, it clicked. And so this is where we are going tonight. We've been in the book of Ephesians a number of times. You've heard me preach from this. I have prayed from this a number of times. But I believe that there is, there is word here that never, ever, well, you can never plumb the depths of it. You can never get to the end of God's word. If God is um, omnipotent, if God is from everlasting to everlasting, if, if the eternal God, before he became eternal, he was He was infinite before that and he limited himself to create time and space for you and me to dwell in if he is that kind of a God and I believe that he is then then this is the word of God right and if it, that is if this is his word then his word is it has his nature it has his ability it has all about him. it has everything about him embedded into this word and so we will never find the end of it. We'll never get to the bottom of it. In fact, it will not be until we reach heaven that we will fully understand all things. But even then, do you know what eternity is going to be? Eternity will be the ever unfolding, the ever unveiling of God himself. We will never... That's why eternity is going to be so magnificent. You're, not, you're never going to be bored in heaven. There's no amusement parks. There's no movie theaters. 
There will be no entertainment there because we will not need anything because we will, we will always be in, in the most, uh, we will be in all continuously. Just think about that. The most beautiful place you've ever seen in all of the world. But when you walked up to it and you, maybe, you, maybe it was the Grand Canyon for you and you walked up and you stood on the brink of that Grand Canyon and you looked down and you saw the, the majestic mountains and the hills and that deep gorge cut through there by the flood. Maybe that was your awe experience or maybe it was tra- traveling to 12,000 feet on top of a mountain and, and enjoying the beautiful beauty of the snow and all of that. Whatever you can imagine, heaven will be for all eternity the ever unveiling and unfolding of this one true omnipotent God. Amen. Amen. I want to go. I want to go. Are, Are you praying? Let me just ask. Are you praying? Even so, come Lord Jesus. If we are not praying, even so come Lord Jesus, then we haven't yet given up earth as our home. Because this world is not my home. This is a a song. I've quoted that verse many, many times. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't. Feel at home in this world anymore. I want to go to heaven. And if he's getting up a load right now, sign me up. Mm -hmm. I saw those eyebrows go up. Heaven is not my goal either. Heaven is not my goal. Heaven is my destination. I'm not shooting for heaven. Because if you have a target that you're aiming for, and if you miss the target or you miss the bullseye, well, you don't, you don't, you don't get points for that. I'm sorry. So I'm not shooting for heaven. I'm going. Let me just follow this vein for a second. You know, that there are moments in our life that every single day we face these moments where we feel just a little bit, where our emotions start to work, they start coming to the surface. We may start to feel angst and frustration. We may start to feel um, a little bit agitated. And then we might start feeling guilty and maybe shamed by what I am feeling. Right? Because we're children of God. And so when we, you know, you would think that as a child of God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have those feelings. We put a little too much pressure on ourselves, I think, uh, but by doing that to ourselves, by, by telling ourselves that I shouldn't be feeling this way. Well, I am a human being, by the way. And I can't get rid of that unless I die. But yesterday, I tried something. Instead of letting that feeling start creeping up and make me mope and get moody. Right? I I can get moody, can't I? I can. So I tried something. Just a little test, if you please. All I did was I just started saying things about myself that the scripture tells me that I am. I just started talking about, I just started telling it, saying it out loud. Whoever's listening, that they they could hear it. I just started saying it. You know what? I'm a child of God. I am born again of the water and the spirit. I am now a son of God. By the new birth, I'm a son of God. And I just kept on with that that flow that God is my father. And I just kept saying it. And it didn't take very long 
for my emotions to change and my feelings to change because my mouth was speaking what was true. Emotions are real, but they're not always true. So we can't rely on our emotions. We have to go with what we know. We have to go with what is sure and steadfast and unmovable. That which is unchangeable, that is the word of God. And what it says about believers is true from now until whenever that end could be. I've heard it said before that eternity, if you were to try to measure time, uh, the time or the length of eternity, it would be like taking a stainless steel ball the size of the earth. And a little dove would pass by that stainless steel ball every thousand years and brush, just brush the tip of her wing against that stainless steel ball one time every thousand years. And when that stainless steel ball was completely worn away, eternity would have just begun. Well, you know that's impossible. You can't, you can't move stainless steel with a feather. So we have no, we have no concept of eternity from this vantage point, from this earthly viewpoint. So when we look at God and His Word, and when we look at what is eternal in the heavens, we have to allow the Spirit to translate that for us. So we have to, we have to block this earthly man's vision of the here and the now and look at the, at the there and the then. Eternity is, is that place that, 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 well, actually, we're in it now. Because my soul is already eternal. It's going to live forever. And so, so when Jesus came in John chapter or John 3, he said that he would, if we would believe on him, then he would give us everlasting life. What does that mean? It means that right now, now, Brother Bowen, I am not waiting for the trumpet to sound to live forever. I am living right now in, in that earnest of the inheritance that's coming to me. Ephesians chapter 1, which is where we're going. We're not going to read that verse, but uh, verse 14, Ephesians 1 says that, that this is the earnest of our inheritance. So what I have here, what God has done for me in the Spirit through every sin that I have ever committed. He's just given me the earnest of what's waiting for me in heaven. So I am eternal right now. Therefore, that should change how we think, shouldn't it? If we truly believe that, that by being born again of the water and the spirit, by coming to an altar, if you, did, if you walk to an altar, repenting of our sins, confessing the wrongs that we have done, and then allowing someone to take us into a pool of water and bury us in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we came out of the water, all of our sins then washed away a clean house. Then, then the life comes, eternal life, everlasting life, comes when the Holy Ghost is poured into us and we speak with that, that heavenly language as the Spirit gives the utterance. We must believe, that should change how I think. And from that point, we need to believe that from then and until when Jesus comes, I am living an everlasting life right now. This is the hope that every believer has. Now. I don't know if I can read this text or not. I don't know if the Lord is done because this is nowhere near what I what was I believed that we were going to be doing tonight. Apparently, either someone in the building needs to hear this or someone watching online, either now or sometime in the future when this is archived on YouTube. I don't know, maybe years down the road, somebody will need to know and hear what I'm saying right now. God is who he said he is, and he will do 
what he said he will do. The promises that he has made. The comments that I made in the very opening before we even went to prayer. The faithfulness of God that endures forever. Faithfulness that cannot change. This faithfulness is what we are living in right now. What keeps you every single day? Who wakes you up in the morning? Who keeps your heart beating during the night? It's impossible for us to stay up all night long and make sure our heart doesn't stop. That's impossible. That's why you go to bed and, and you close your eyes. And you, when you lay your head on that pillow and you close your eyes and go to sleep, you are, you are unconscious. But you know how we can do that and not worry and fret about falling asleep? Am I going to wake up in the morning, toss and turn all night long, worried about dying in my sleep? You know how I can, how I can sleep and that not happen? It's because my God is faithful. He is the resurrection and the life. One of the scriptures that we, we, we might as well try to read it now. But the same spirit that was wrought in Christ when he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father is the same spirit that is resident in you and me right now. Do, well, nobody said amen, but maybe I need to talk about that for a second. Thank you, Sister Celia. But the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, I've got scripture for it. It's Ephesians chapter 1. Well, we might as well try to read this. So let's go to verse 15. Ephesians 1 verse 15. Wherefore I also, this is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God, okay, this is what he's prayed. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. There's a semicolon in my Bible. That, so that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, the God of of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Him, that is Christ Jesus. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. There is, there is still not a period. In my Bible, there is a colon there. So this, this point, this whole sentence continues. It's a very long sentence. So first of all, when Paul is praying for his, his, these converts of his, y'all remember Ephesus, right? You remember, oh, that, that was Philippi. I'm thinking about the jail that he was, that they were put in the Philippian jail. Uh, it, it was in uh, Ephesus, Well, I got those stories wrong. I'm drawing a blank. Forgive me. We'll move on. So Paul's writing to these believers in Ephesus. And he's telling them, I am praying for you daily. I cease not to make mention of you in my prayers. That God will give you wisdom and revelation. Now, those two are inseparable. So when God gives wisdom, he's giving wisdom for a purpose. He's giving wisdom for the revelation that is about to come. Because if we just get revelation and we don't know how to apply it, that revelation, it doesn't really work for us. But he gives wisdom and the revelation that works together. In the knowledge of him, and the purpose is in verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So these are the eyes, not our natural eyes, these are our spiritual eyes, the heart, the heart eyes. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. One writer says, your eyes being flooded with light. That for the purpose of. Now here's, this is the crux of the matter. This is what Paul was praying. And so this is what I pray for you. 
And actually, if you go back to verse Uh, verse 1, Paul said, this is who he's praying for. An apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So who does that encompass? It, it encompasses every believer. So this book is not just written to the Ephesians, but Paul is addressing you and me in the 21st century. He says, I'm praying for this, that your eyes will be flooded with light. Number one that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Now, throughout the New Testament, that word hope most generally refers to the hope that we have in the resurrection. So Paul wants his, these people to understand that if you are born again, if you are children of God, then you already have this hope resident inside of you. That as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, the same spirit that dwells in the believer right now has, is providing for your life after death. This is one of the things when I started praying this. It, it just it clicked in my spirit. Why? Why are we even afraid to die? If, if there were not believers who were not afraid to die, then the scripture in 1 John chapter 4 wouldn't be in there where John said, if he said that, um, that perfect love cast out fear and he that feareth has not been made perfect in love. What are you fearing? In that one, those verses, you're, the, the person was, or the, the writer was writing to people who were fearing the judgment. But for the child of God, we have nothing to fear in the afterlife. If we are told to live in no fear now, to live in the perfect love of God and, and His perfect love cast out fear, period. There's no A-L-L -L in that sentence. It's not all fear, it's just fear, period. If you live in the, in, the, in the pure love of God, if you know every single day that God loves you unquestionably, unequivocally, if you believe that God loves you and you, you woke up this morning and he loved you. And you may have been, you may have had a day full of mistakes. You may have had a day full of failures. But that does not change the fact what Jesus said in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, the whole world, that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I don't care what the scriptures say in that particular place. It doesn't take away the fact that we are still human beings. And human beings are flawed from birth. We are flawed. Thanks to Adam, we are flawed. The moment we take our first breath in this world, that yes, we start living, but we also start dying at that moment. And so we come into this world right out of our mother's womb and all of our flaws and all of our hang-ups are embedded in that tiny little baby. He doesn't know it yet. The parents don't know it yet. He's perfect. Right? Just like Carter is. Man, that little boy is absolutely perfect. But embedded in the DNA of that child and it will come out sooner or later. All of those flaws and those hang-ups that we all came into this world with. And God never excused those things. But he made provisions for those things. Oh, my father. You made provisions for the things that, that you knew we were coming into the world with. He could have shamed us. He could have just, just bumped us off for crying out loud. He could have done it. But instead of that, he gave us grace. Not just grace, but John 1 says he gave us grace for grace. We, we can't fathom that. I have tried. I have looked at that verse, and I have looked at the concordance, and I've tried to make sense how he would give us grace 
so that we could have grace or have so we can attain grace or touch grace. He has to do it for us. Jesus said it in John chapter 5. He said that no man can come to the Father unless, unless the Spirit draw him. And Jesus said, you're not even going to get to the Father unless you come through me. So it's God that does this for us. Why? Why do we live, especially new believe, or new birth believers? Why do we live under that shadow, un, under that cloud of, I, I, I might die? I might. The day's not over till midnight. I, you know, I wouldn't mind living a little longer, but I'm ready to go right now. But we should never have any fear whatsoever of what is in the hereafter. The scripture has already given us, has given us plain understanding about what's waiting for us. Yes, there's going to be a judgment bar. Yes, there's going to be a place where the righteous and the unrighteous will pass before that, that, that throne and we will all be judged. But, but for the believer, it, yes, we'll be judged and our crowns will reflect the judgment of what we did while we were on earth. But we made it! Yes, I would like to be sitting on one of those thrones ruling over cities. And that's what will happen in the millennium. We will rule. Some of us will rule over one city. Some of us will rule over many cities. Because we are preparing to be kings and priests in that realm. So what do we have to fear? So when the Apostle Paul is writing to the Ephesians, first of all, he wants them to know this hope that you, that you were given. And can I tell you, oh, my father, hope goes beyond faith. Because when you have exercised your faith, now what you have is the result of faith is the hope. Just flip over to Romans chapter 8. Yeah, Romans chapter 8. Just a couple of books, three or four books back the other direction. Okay, let's start reading at verse 19. For the earnest expectation in this word creature can be the King James translated creature, but it really is creation. For the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. The creation itself is held in chains, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. That's you and me. So the earth is groaning. This is the reason the earth is groaning right now because it's in pain. It's hurting because of the evil that's in here because the earth itself knows, according to the scripture that I'm about to read, the earth knows there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. The earth knows this. This, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Because the creation, verse 21, itself, also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. That is the coming of the Lord. Verse 24. For we are saved by hope. Now this, that word saved 
is not the new birth experience. This word saved has to do with the redemption of our body. It has to do with the, the, the end of all things when Jesus comes. That's when we are saved. I'm beginning to think a little differently about my that I have salvation. I am born again of the water and spirit, but I will not truly be saved until the day when Jesus comes and takes me out of this world. This is the language of the Romans chapter 8. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. So whatever you are hoping for, whatever your faith led you to believe and you accepted the gospel message, someone preached to you, you were persuaded by what they preached, that persuasion brought faith. Then you, on that faith that came by the word, you exercised that faith and you were obedient to the scriptures. Therefore, you were born again. Now, that born again experience has planted within the bosom of every one of us this thing called hope. But what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Did I leave a line out? For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? This is future tense. This is something that's still out there. This is the coming of the Lord that we are waiting and watching for right now. But verse 25, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. That is the hope of the resurrection. This is exactly what Paul was praying for the Ephesians that they would have. I'm, he said, I am praying for you. That you would have this, the hope. I'm not, I, I don't think I'm finished in Romans 8, but I need, to, I need to finish that line. The hope of his calling. And we know, but we studied this before. Our calling is the calling to the gospel or the calling by the gospel to salvation. This is an, another place uh, Paul writing to the Philippians said, uh, I believe, no, it was Peter. I'm sorry, First Peter, where he says, he says that we need to make our calling and election sure. He called me. He elected me to have this glorious gift of the Holy Ghost. Now it's up to me what I do with it. I have to make it sure. That means I pray. That means I seek God's word. That means I fellowship the body. It means a lot of things for us. Paul said, I, I want you to know what is the hope of your calling. When you were called by the gospel, by that call, by you accepting the call to repent of your sins and be water baptized in Jesus' name and be filled with the Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. When that, when that event occurred in your life, you now have the hope of the resurrection living in you because of the calling. So let's, let's continue in, in chapter 8 very quickly of Romans. So verse 25 again, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, this thought continues. The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. The hope of the resurrection, do you see this? When he goes to verse 26 and he says, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities, that, that spirit, when it says also, is referring to the hope of the resurrection in the previous two verses. So the hope of the resurrection should sustain me. I should live every single day of my life in the hope that if I die, this fleshly body dies and goes to corruption, my soul will not stay here. My soul will go to its eternal abode in the heavens. That should sustain us. Do you believe that?
likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us in our behalf with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He maketh intercession for the saints. Now, I do not have the vocabulary to, to make this point as clear as I would like it to be clear tonight. But our Heavenly Father has made abundant provisions for us in the Scriptures, telling us, showing us that when we were filled with the Holy Ghost, what we now possess, we have the hope of the resurrection. I have the power of the Holy Ghost that when I don't know what to pray, He will help me. He will pray for me. Not for me, but He will pray in my stead, in my behalf. One never needs to hang their head in shame over not knowing what to pray or not knowing how to pray. Especially a child of God should never have that problem if I don't know what to say, if I just get quiet for a second. I don't know if the Holy Ghost has ever checked you when you're trying to pray and you're just you're just trying to pull words out of somewhere, just trying to put sentences together, and finally you just realize this is futile. You didn't say amen, so I guess I'm the only one. Just about the time I'm ready to go over to the wall and pray. The Holy Ghost says, he doesn't say it like this, but in my vernacular, he says, chill out, dude. I got this. You don't have to dream this up. If there's no flow, stop. Find it. Where is it? What direction is it flowing today? What is he wanting to say today? What, what channel is he flowing? Remember, remember uh, I believe it was... Um, Brother Barber read that psalm Sunday morning. Anybody remember what that was? Where he said the, the, the rivers, um, I can't remember. I think it was, it was Psalm 60 something, wasn't it? Anybody remember? Ah, I'm sorry. I'm taking time. Uh, 46. He says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. There is a river. But he says there are streams coming off of that river. That shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. What is the dwelling place of the Most High? He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, so where does he dwell? Right here. So those streams coming off of there, we just need to find out which one he's flowing in our direction today. Instead of beating our head against a brick wall, trying to pull words from nowhere, Stop and just listen a moment. And if you don't hear anything, then just start reaching out quietly. Don't try to put a lot of words. Just Jesus, I bless you, Father. I thank you for your grace and goodness. And, and many times it doesn't take very long. And then that little switch just clicks. And, and you don't, you're not even thinking about it. And it switches over into tongues. And before you know it, you, you, you're flowing in the Spirit. And then, all of a sudden, bam, there comes this river of words that you, that you didn't think about, 
you didn't plan on saying, you didn't plan on praying that prayer, it just comes out. I have to tell you this, and I can't repeat it because I don't remember everything that was said, but last night my wife and I um, were praying before we went to bed, and I always go around, walk around to her side of the bed and, and put my hand on her head, and we, and we pray. And I opened my mouth. I just opened my mouth, and, and the words that started coming out of my mouth, in my mind, I'm thinking, where in the world is this coming from? I'm serious as a heart attack. It never crossed my mind. Any of those words that was coming out, every last thing, it was just, I, I was just repeating what was being said to me. And it only lasted for just a, a, a little bit. I, I, I don't know if it lasted a whole minute. But, but when I stopped praying, it was like, I wanted to ask the question, where did that come from? I knew where it came from. Those are the moments that I live for. When I don't have to pray myself, but the Spirit makes intercession for us in ways that we will never understand. Okay. I have no idea what time it is. I don't have my watch or my phone. What? Okay, let's go back to Ephesians 1. Let's try to get through this, these verses. Verse 18 again. He prayed that the eyes of their understanding being enlightened, that for the purpose of you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Okay, that's King James English for the bride of Christ. Because we are Christ's inheritance. I don't know how it's going to look in heaven and how we will be presented. But in, in Jewish times, the father would, was, was always a major part of the ceremony when a, when a young couple was getting married and the, the father would present the bride to the groom, and there was this big ceremony. So I really don't know what it's going to look like in heaven. But we will be presented as the bride of Christ. So we, this is what Paul is wanting these people in Ephesus and then the faithful in Christ Jesus to understand. You have this great hope of the resurrection, and now you also have this, this wonderful, rich, Blessing, the riches of the glory of Christ's inheritance in the saints. That's how I felt too. I don't have words to express what this means to us. In all of our humanity, God made provisions that we would someday leave this earth and stand upon a street of gold in pure and spotless white robes, sinless for all eternity. And he will say to his bride, come join me at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're his inheritance. Down here on earth, we don't look like much. I spoke for all of us. Because we've all got it, right? We've all got that humanity. And so we, you know, we can show off sometimes, can't we? Okay, I can. I, I, I can be a character at times. I can say things and do things and act in ways that I know I shouldn't. But I still have the hope of being the bride of Christ, Debbie. If I'm willing to admit those faults and failures on a regular basis, if I'm willing to humble myself before the throne of the living God and say, Father, I, I know you filled me with your spirit, but I, I didn't do so good today. 
I acted up. I acted a... Well, I won't... Yeah, I just acted up. Thank you. Would you please forgive me? And it doesn't change that I am still part of this glorious bride of Christ. And then this is the one. This is the one that stands out of those three. He said, I want you to know what is the hope of his call. Glory of his inheritance in the saints. And he said, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. I believe that's a comma there, if I'm not mistaken, in the King James, at least in my Bible, there's a comma there. But before we move on, I have to mention that word believe because the word believe there is, is never translated faith. That Greek word that is translated believe is never translated faith, even though many people will refer to that word as faith. It is not faith as in the word faith, but it comes from faith. Because if you take, if you go to your Greek concordance, if you use Blue Letter Bible, you can follow this back. When you look at the word believe in the Greek, the word is pisteo. And you, get, you go to the root word for pisteo, it's pistis, which is faith. So believing, being able to act, and that word believe is a verb, and a verb is an action word which, which denotes action, right? It means that I'm doing something, that I'm acting upon my faith, because faith without works is dead, right? So this is what believing is. This is my works coupled with my faith. But then you, you go back to the root word for for faith, it's, a, it's the Greek word pethos or pathos. I, I'm, not, I'm not a Greek scholar by any stretch. But that word means to be persuaded. That means to be persuaded with words. So somebody had to tell you about Jesus. Somebody had to witness to you. Somebody preached to you. Somebody gave you the gospel. And so by those words that were spoken out of the word of God, you allowed yourself to be persuaded. And that persuasion brought faith. And then by that faith that you now have in God and his word, you exercise that faith by obedience to God and his word. That is where the word believe comes in. exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe that word believe is if I'm not mistaken it is in the present tense that means it is something I am doing right now and it's ongoing in my life I am constantly a believing I am constantly being obedient to God and his word because you don't you're not just obedient once and that's the be all and the end all no this is a um, I hate to use this word but it is my growing in grace is an evolution from what I was to what I'm going to be. I never arrived, right? The, uh, Paul, to I believe it was the Galatians, said that I have not apprehended that for which has apprehended me. He said, I don't possess the Holy Ghost. I don't have a, a lock and chain on the Spirit. The Spirit has me. And if I live according to God and His Word, then the Spirit will continue to have me. But if I'm a numbskull and I walk away from God and go do my own thing, then guess what? Now the Spirit doesn't have control of me anymore. Now I'm walking by the will of flesh. And now I'm out of fellowship. I am not in the house with the Father. I am now a prodigal son. I'm not in His house. I am away from the Father. So I believe continuously. So when you, you have to read that with this in mind, the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe right now and who continue to believe. If we expect God's power to work in us and through us on a continual basis, which is what, what has to happen in this end time revival and harvest, 
I've said this many times. The manifestation of the Spirit is not a magic trick. God's not just going to snap His fingers and this is going to happen here and this is going to happen over here. It doesn't work that way. Jesus, go read the book of John. Read what Jesus did. Especially, this is what I was thought we were going to talk about tonight was John chapter 5. J- Jesus healed the, the man at the, at the pool of Bethesda. He had lain there for 38 years, and Jesus healed the man, and it just happened to be on the Sabbath day. And man, they jumped on Jesus with all four feet because he healed on the Sabbath day. And then he let them have it with both barrels. He came back at them. He says, he says I only do what my father does. What I see my father do, that's what I do. My father healed that man, so I healed that man. This is what he said. Go read John chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 when he healed the blind man on the Sabbath day. Oh, God forbid that he would do something like that on the Sabbath day. So Jesus only did what his father showed him or told him that he needed to do. And this is how it's going to work in this end time revival and harvest that You and I are going to be Jesus to this world. And this verse of scripture has got to come alive in us right here, right now. We need to know. Paul prayed, Lord, open their eyes. Flood their eyes with light, this wisdom and revelation, so they will know what is the hope of his calling. So that they will know what is the riches of the glory of Christ's inheritance in the church. And that they will know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. According to, that word according, man, that is a powerful word. And he uses it a lot in Ephesians chapter 1. But this this is the connection. He's tying this to the resurrection of the Christ. According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. This same power that God is expecting to flow in us and then through us to this world, is the exact same power that was used when Christ, who had lain on that slab in the tomb for three days, suddenly came back to life. I know, it's hard for our human, man, our human mind to grasp this. For someone to come back from the grave is, it's not unheard of, but it's, Unheard of, right? Someone who's dead, they already pulled the sheet over their head and hung the tag on their toe and then, and then for them to suddenly start breathing again for the spirit that left their body that made the heart to stop now returns into that body and starts that heart beating again. Yeah, my my response is the same as yours right now. I'm flabbergasted by the scripture and what it's saying to us and what it says for us. I'm having trouble grasping it myself, but this is the power that is in the believer. Every child of God who's ever been washed in water, filled with the Spirit, spoken in other tongues as the Spirit gave you the utterance to speak it, This power that raised Christ from the dead is in you. And it's in me. And God is expecting, according to what Paul is praying, God is expecting that power to flow in us and through us. And if it means laying our hands on a dead man and seeing him raised to life, that's what it means. There's there's other people that have seen it. I can't say that, that I've, I've been there yet. I, I prayed for a man in the ER. I told you this story one time. I prayed for a man in the ER. And he had been dead for quite some time. And when I laid my hand on his, I don't know if it was on his head or his shoulder or whatever it was, I laid my hands on him. It was in my mind. This man's going to live. He didn't. It wasn't because I didn't have faith. That wasn't the will of God for that man to live. 
Paul said, I want you to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power. To usward who believe, who are believing now and will continue to believe, acting. That is, again, as a verb, I'm acting, I'm being obedient, I'm following the leading of the Spirit, which he wrought in Christ. Let's, let's, let's just finish the chapter. According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above. This is where our Jesus is. Far above. Not just above, but far above all principality and power and might and dominion. Every power, every ruler, every president, every spiritual wickedness in the atmosphere. He is far above every dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. In this world right now, Jesus is seated far above. And that seated part is is, is authority and dominion. He is a king sitting on a throne. Now he rules from a sitting position. That means everything is already under his feet. Verse 22. And have put all things under his feet. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body. Pat yourself somewhere on your body and say, that's me. He is the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. I know we don't see everything that's under our feet yet, but it's there. One in a certain place testifies, saying, What is man? Hebrews chapter 2. What is man that thou hast. Uh, I lost my place. That thou art mindful of him, or the Son of man that thou visitest him. Hebrews 1 6 through 10. 11, 12, somewhere in there. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crowned him with glory and honor, and to set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. That's, that's us. That's the body of Christ. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus. Who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor. That he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. And bringing many sons into glory. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one and I will add this word, Father. I added that because that's who he's referring to. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So if everything is under Jesus' feet, and the scripture says that everything is under our feet, but we don't see it all yet, but we see Jesus. And he says that you're my brother. Therefore, if it's under his feet, it's under mine. Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And say it. Anybody remember? Nothing shall by any means hurt you. So, Father, according to your word, we have power and authority. Because we are under authority. You have given us, O oh Lord, spiritual authority. You've given us a head. You've given us even the head here on earth and then Christ in heaven, Lord. So you've given us a covering of authority. And therefore, now we have this authority that's been delegated to us to operate in your kingdom here on earth. 
And so, Father, I am praying as Paul prayed for your people, that their eyes will be flooded with light, that this wisdom and revelation will show them, Lord, giving them understanding what is the hope of their calling, what is the riches of the glory of Christ's inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. Father, this power that you put in your church, Is this power, O Lord, that you are expecting us to participate in and with. And that, O Lord, we have your name. And so, Lord, we should not take this name in vain and not do anything with it. But, Lord, what you have given us now, Lord, exercising our faith in those things. Seeking to find that flow every day. Find and know and then do your will every day, O Lord. And and even if it doesn't seem like much, if I'm doing the will of God, then I'm not doing my own will and and, and becoming iniquity. But I'm walking in you, O Lord. But teach us, Lord, to understand this power and authority that we have as sons of God. That as you were in the earth, Lord Jesus, so now we are empowered by the same Spirit that raised you from the dead. So, Father, I pray this understanding, this wisdom and understanding upon your people, I pray, for your glory and for the honor of your name and kingdom. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. I thank you for being here on Wednesday night. Thank you for your faithfulness to the house of the Lord. May the Lord richly bless you. For those of you who are, were invited to the event on Saturday, um, that starts at.